Have you ever wondered how easy it is for you to use a computer? We have various devices such as keyboards, mouses, Bluetooth devices and various other inputs. But for a paralyzed person, the only means of communication for him are his thoughts. Hence, we in the group of TG01, I'm Jason, we have our teammates Varun, Raihan and Jewel. We are here to present our project which is BCI based cursor control for Windows. So, what is BCI? BCI or Brain Computer Interface records EEG signals from our brains, uh, decodes it and classifies it into a certain action that the user wishes, wishes to perform. We present Brain Computer Interface which allows the user to control a Windows cursor by just using his thoughts. All the user has to do is think about moving up, down, left or right and the click and the cursor moves accordingly. So the user, all he has to do is think about the certain action that he wants to perform. The EEG data is captured and decoded on, onto a computer. Then a model is generated using BCI Lab and trained using the EEG data that we have collected. And this model is then used to predict the next set of actions that the user wants to perform. So a fresh data is streamed uh, into the model and uh, a control signal is generated to move the cursor according to the user's wish. Next, we have the objectives which will be continued by Varun. Since the project was considerably large and we had several small steps to finish, we segmented the objectives into five or six different parts so that we knew uh, that we were progressing enough and as, as efficiently as we could. The first step was to pre-process signals since we were not using any online data set and we used the BCI headset. We need to really understand how the data worked and what pre-processing chains it required so that we could get the best cluster output. The next step was to uh, build something called BCI algorithm. A uh, BCI lab algorithm is the entire pre -proce uh, is the entire processing chain, uh, including some pre processing, some uh, feature extraction, and then finally uh, going into the linear distance analysis classifier, which we will all see uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, finally, we had to annotate events whenever our subject was mo imagining the movement of left and right hand. We had to mark the digital events on two different channels on the headset so that the classifier would know. On, on at what times the action was happening. Finally, the BCI lab uh, algorithm trains the model and then uh, we use a model to live stream data real time. We use uh, real time data to move the computer cursor. So uh, any BCI lab or any signal processing application has pretty much the same algorithm. You pre-process, you uh, have a signal processing block which extracts some control signals. You feed that control signals to something called Java robot class. Which, you, which internally manages to move the mouse. So normally you're used to moving the mouse physically, but here internally through software we have to move the mouse, so that uh, is taken care of by something called uh, Java robot class. So the, the algorithm or signal processing chain extracts these control signals and feeds it to Java robot class to either move left, right, up or down. In any machine learning uh, application or project, it is really essential to understand how uh, data goes from time series to the final classification output. So here, uh, these are 16 channels that we have. We use 16 channel data, and the uh, so the essential idea of any of our project is to identify something called oscillatory processes. Oscillatory processes are when a set of neurons in the brain are inactive and they're not really doing anything. They synchronize with each other, each, with each other and that leads to the oscillatory process. So uh, when we have motor, motor imagery or imagination of motor movements some part of the brain, this, the, the sensory motor cortices are active and thus the oscillatory, the, the, the power in the oscillatory uh, signals reduce because of activity. So we essentially try to see what parts of the brain are inactive and from that we deduce what parts of the brain are actually active. The essence of the entire uh, the algorithm is computing the magnitude of DFTs of, the, of, of some data. But the reason is, but the problem is we can't apply the magnitude DFT directly on the time series channel data because that throws away the base information. And that base or rather source information is really important for uh, the classifier to actually reduce between left and right and imagination. So if we have the nonlinearity of the magnitude of DFT process on the channel data and throw away all the base information, you can't train the classifier well enough or in fact at all. So a way to extract that base of source information is using a linear process uh, of spatially filtering the data. So uh, essentially what is happening is a simple linear multiplication of weights on the channel data to give us something called source activity. Uh, so source activity is just what parts of the brain are projecting some sort of electrical signal on what channels. So you multiply by, by that by some weight 
and uh, if you get these and you compute the magnitude of the DFT and to get the features to the linear discriminant analysis classifier. So we're using the top six maximally informative features after phase filtering. So we have the six uh, 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 outputs of the uh, weighting process, spatial filtering process into the linear discriminant analysis problem, which is just a linear, uh, a linear combination of its features to give the classifier output. So the question then is, how do you manage train W? How do you manage train theta? Train theta is easy, LDA will take care of it, but LDA can't really manage to uh, train W or, or optimize W because it has a custom non-linearity in the middle. It cannot uh, optimize the entire chain. So the best way to uh, find W, optimum W, is to make some statistical assumptions about the data that we just collect. That assumption is joint Gaussianity. Joint Gaussianity of the, of the data essentially means, uh, so we know normal data in, in uh, uh, simpler dimensions. An extension of that into multiple dimensions is called joint Gaussianity. We make that assumption, that statistical assumption about the, about the channel data that is recorded and the problem then becomes tractable, it becomes uh, solvable as, next slide, as a simple uh, optimization problem, a constraint optimization problem. And that is called spectral CSP, or, uh, or in specifically common spatial pattern. The, the job of common spatial pattern filtering is to maximize the variance between data. So as a speed up now, uh, is to maximize, so in, before CSP filtering you see that uh, the left hand is right hand, uh, left hand, left, so that hand corresponds to one color, right hand corresponds to the other color. It's not really possible to differentiate them before CSP filtering. But after CSP filtering, you know that one, uh, when you distribute the scatter plot of uh, the amplitudes, you see that one varies, that is the other varies across another channel. And that sort of maximizes the variance or diagonalizes the data. So uh, once you make the assumption, it becomes a simple uh, constrained optimization problem. So what you're trying to do is find W such that this is maximum. But you, uh, then you can say, just make W infinity and maximize it. So that's why we constrain the optimization by saying, uh, this is the, uh, sigma is the, uh, the constrained optimization problem is just maximizing, finding W such that this term is maximum. So you can say that you can just make W infinity, but that, uh, so that, that's why we impose a certain constraint on the problem, and that's why it's called a constrained optimization problem. And this is a constraint, this is just the, uh, the covariance matrices for, for uh, one class, minus one is one class, plus one is the other class, and then you add that together, we have the average covariance matrix, and then you multiply that by the spatial filter before and after, and that should be one. Which basically means that if one uh, a class is maximum variance, the other should have minimum, and uh, the opposite goes to as well. So, so the pre-processing chain will be explained by a uh, So for data pre-processing, we used uh, EG lab. EG lab is a uh, MATLAB toolbox for pre-processing for processing EG data. So uh, in step one, we have uh, all 16 channel locations are added. Uh, so channel locations are basically the XYZ coordinates of uh, all 16 electrodes in your uh, EG headset. Uh, and then we have the second step, in which events were extracted from two different annotations, uh, imagination of left hand movement and imagination of right hand movement, which is respectively values one and uh, And in third step, we remove bad channels. Uh, we can remove bad channels uh, by visually make out which are the main outliers from the data that we have. And uh, it was common median reference to remove consistent noise. And then line removal to remove line noise at 50 to 60 hertz. Line noise is basically uh, uh, due to supply, supply or uh, background noise such as DEC. Uh, then we have the goal set, in which the DC offset was supplied. Yeah. 
So we use uh, Java Remote Class for process control. Uh, Java Remote Class essentially is an inbuilt library used for test automation, self-running demos, etc. Where you need to uh, uh, you need to use the control of peripherals like boxes or keyboards. In this case, we're using the control of mouse. Uh, so with the help of Java Remote Class, we got MATLAB to use the classify result, which is a scalar quantity, to move the Windows cursor. So every time uh, a classifier output is pulled, the cursor moves to the left or to the right by some fixed amount. Have its correct 